Good evening, John Berman here in for Anderson. Tonight, police have a name and a face to go with the Christmas market truck attack in Berlin. However, their suspect, this man, a native Tunisian named Anas Amri, is at large. Authorities say he could be armed, he could be violent, and here's what's worse. He was already on their radar before Monday's horror unfolded, and a dozen people lost their lives. Now, not only was he known, at one point he was in custody. Tonight, he's a fugitive. CNN's Aaron McLaughlin joins us now live from Berlin with the latest on the search for him. And Aaron, what are we learning about this suspect? Hi, John. Well, we know that he had at least two run-ins with German authorities in August. Uh, they actually arrested him trying to cross illegally into Italy on forged documents, but the German judge in that case, for some reason, took the decision to let him go. We also know that in June, German authorities tried to deport him, but failed to do so uh, after being unable to establish his true identity, all of this leading to some very serious Serious questions here in Berlin tonight as to what authorities could have done to prevent these attacks, John. Yeah, 58165 on the run, believed to be dangerous right now. They're offering a 100,000 euro reward for any information leading to his capture. I understand his father is also speaking about him. What is he saying? That's right. His father gave an interview to a Tunisian radio network in which he said that his son left for Italy when he was a teenager. While he was in Italy, he was arrested and convicted of armed robbery, spent four years in an Italian prison. He was released from jail, and that's when he made his way to the Cologne area of Germany. It was there that he, uh, he had, according to his father, run in with Islam. Already leading to some fresh questions tonight as to why the Italians simply let someone who was convicted of armed robbery, someone who was not supposed to be in the EU, simply walk away from prison and make his way to Germany. Someone who was very clearly on their radar. Aaron, last question. You're in Berlin. Just curious at this point, several nights after the attack, what's the security posture on the streets there? Is it visible? Uh, it's absolutely visible, John, although they're trying to get things back to normal uh, as quickly as possible. This thoroughfare, which leads uh, in the direction of the attack, now open to traffic, been previously closed off. But we have seen an increased police presence throughout the city, especially focusing on transportation networks, airports, and railway stations as people are trying to get home for Christmas, home for the holidays. Yeah, especially given the fact that there is this manhunt underway for this man and believed to be armed, believed to be dangerous, and now we learn believed to possibly have links with ISIS figures within Germany. Aaron McLaughlin, thank you so much. Also with us tonight, CNN terrorism analyst Paul Cruikshank, Daily Beast senior editor Michael Weiss, author of ISIS, Inside the Army of Terror, and CNN national security analyst Peter Bergen, author of United States of Jihad. And Paul Cruikshank, let me start to you. You've been working your sources again inside Germany and across Europe. What have you learned about the suspect and his background? Well, uh, he was violent before he, he was radical, it, it seems, uh, from what the father has told Tunisian radio. But when he came to Germany very quickly, was on the radar screen of uh, German counterterrorism services, part of a uh, extremist uh, network inside Germany recruiting for ISIS um, and had a, a number of contacts with uh, leading figures uh, in that um, ISIS recruiting uh, network. Uh, the German counterterrorism services considered him dangerous, they considered him a risk. Um, at a certain point of time, um, it, it came to their attention that he was trying to get hold of a weapon. Uh, so there were a lot of um, alarm bells that were ringing uh, within uh, German security services uh, when it came to this individual. Uh, but it appears a lot of balls were dropped uh, and he was still able uh, to launch this attack. And, and that will be the source of many, many questions. Already is, but certainly going forward. Michael, you've been working your sources as well. Anas Amri, believed to have contact with this German figure, this man named Ahmed Abdulaziz, as nom de guerre as Abu Allah, head of a, of a pro ISIS network inside Germany. What do we know about him? He's been arrested and charged with terror offenses last month. Yeah, along with four other guys in his pro-ISIS network. Um, according to a guy who had actually gone off to Syria and joined ISIS and then defected because he renounced the ideology, 
Abu Allah, as, you, as he's known, uh, is the number one ISIS recruitment director in all of Germany. This is the, the mastermind of German jihad. In his network, uh, there were two individuals. One of them is a German Serb called Boban S. His last name has not been identified by the German authorities yet, who ran a kind of ad hoc Islamic center out of his apartment, also in the North Rhine Westphalia region, which is where Amri came from and also where Abu uh, Walla lives or lived. Uh, and in this center, apparently, he was indoctrinating any and all customers to the, the Salafi jihadi doctrine and also arranging for people to make emigration to Syria. Now, according to a German outlet that uh, reported on this today, um, uh, Amri was given a choice. You could I he could either go and make immigration or Hijra himself and join ISIS and fight on the battlefields of the Middle East, or he could carry out a terrorist operation on German soil. And that decision or that choice given to him was said to have been personally signed off by Abu Walla. Mm -hmm. Abu Walla, by the way, has a Facebook fan page that has something like 25,000 followers. He posts uh, these sermons. He's always dressed in a black cloak and a hood. You can never really see his face on his social media, but now he's been identified and arrested, so people know who he is. It's so interesting. The Germans yeah. are working under the assumption that this, the man they're looking for, Anas Omri, directly connected to a main ISIS figure inside yeah. Germany right now, and this is just the beginning of the investigation. Peter Bergen, so what are the implications of this on two fronts? Number one, if this suspect, Anas Omri, is part of this network, does it make him harder to find? Is it possible that it would be easier or there would be more people working to hide him right now? And the second part is, does it make the situation even more dangerous right now? This is something we saw, we believe, in Belgium, where it seems as if some of the attacks that did transpire were carried out more quickly because some of these terrorists felt they, they had to get it done before they were caught. I, John, I think the answer is uh, yes and yes. I think the, the fact that there is, you know, he seems to be, have some links to the network makes it easier for him to hide. Uh, the fact that there is a network means that it's more likely to carry out attacks. Um, you know, the situation in the United States is quite different. Uh, there's really no analog uh, that we have in the United States where you have, uh, as Germany has had, 800 Germans go and fight in Syria and get training, and then, you know, perhaps thousands of fellow travelers who essentially uh, identify with ISIS ideology. And that story, of course, is true in France, where 1,500 have gone to get training, and there are literally you know, more than 10,000 sort of uh, extremist uh, sympathizers. So in every European country, there is a network that you can plug into, and we saw that after Paris attacks and Brussels. Uh, so, you know, the situation in Germany, which is luckily the Germans really haven't had quite the same problems as the Belgians and the French hitherto, and now we have this attack. Uh, you know, in, in, in European country after European country, we're seeing uh, that there is a pretty vibrant uh, ISIS support network that is quite different than what we see in the mm -hmm. United States. Paul Cruikshank, you know, authorities had him under observation. He was on their radar. They had him in custody at one point, but obviously not enough to keep him. What did they get? during that time and what were they looking for that they didn't get that would have allowed him to the authorities to place him under arrest or expel him well that's a, a very good question uh, in, indeed um, they um, did learn that he was trying to to get hold of a, a gun uh, during uh, that period they did learn that he had these extremist uh, ties um, inside uh, Germany, uh, including uh, to an individual called Boban Simeonovic, uh, who is the, the, the Serbian German leading figure in this ISIS recruiting uh, network, uh, somebody who was close to Abu uh, Wala that the Michael was talking about. All these people were arrested back uh, in uh, November. So just a few weeks ago, they actually arrested five of the key leaders of this recruiting network, uh, but they did not uh, manage to arrest uh, this uh, perpetrator, this suspect in the uh, mm -hmm. Berlin uh, attack. Uh, he escaped uh, the dragnet um, in, in those arrests. Michael Weiss, born in Tunisia. Tunisia is a country that has ended up supplying a huge number uh, of, of ISIS soldiers. By orders of magnitude. I mean, we focus on the, the graduates who come from the West, but most of the people who go off to join ISIS who aren't from Syria and Iraq come from countries in the Middle East. Why Tunisia? This is a good, great question. I mean, Tunisia is one, the, oh, probably now the only country that uh, went through the so-called Arab Spring to have kind of had a peaceful transfer of power and to have reconciled what it, it turned out to be an Islamist government with its sort of traditional Franco-secular um, history. Maybe it's just because they don't find a hospitable environment in Tunisia. They're, they're going off and, and wanting to do jihad elsewhere. But it's, it's, it's also a problem that people who return, where do they then migrate to? I mean, this guy, uh, obviously, he went to Italy, he was mm -hmm. arrested, and then he got out uh, using forged papers, apparently, to try and come back into Italy. 
how did he get into Europe, and why wasn't he on, on the radars of uh, not just the German in, in counterterrorism officials, but the sort of the EU system that's meant to kind of, you know, invigilate these borders? These history. are questions they'll be asking, hopefully, once they do catch him again. Manhunt underway tonight, you know, a warning across Europe, a 100,000 euro reward being posted for the hat capture of Anas Omri. Michael Weiss, Peter Bergen. Guys, thanks so much. Paul, stick around because I want to ask you about surveillance cameras like the kind that led to the Boston bombers or helped capture them ultimately and, and why we have yet to see this type of video out of Berlin. And then later, with much of Europe now looking for the Berlin truck attack suspect, German lawmakers have started rethinking privacy restrictions that have until now limited the use of surveillance cameras. In a country with a totalitarian past, expanding the tools of the state and especially state security is controversial. However, as CNN's Bryn Gingras reports, it has worked elsewhere. When a bomb exploded during the 2013 Boston Marathon, surveillance cameras showed the smoke rising over the finish line. But that wasn't all they revealed. For investigators, footage from street cameras exposed critical information. The faces of the Sarnayev brothers who set off the explosion and the backpack they used to carry the bomb to the race. Those pictures eventually wallpapered the city and aided in the capture of Jokar Sarnayev. His brother Tamerlan was killed in a gun battle with police. While footage authorities obtain from closed circuit television sometimes depicts difficult moments to watch, each frame can prove to be invaluable to investigators. It often leads authorities to the suspects, as it did in Boston. In Brussels, twin explosions at the airport and a train station in March were documented by passengers. Cell phone video revealed devastating wreckage through thick smoke. But the investigation quickly centered around this image taken from the airport's surveillance cameras. Three men pushing luggage carts, two of them suicide bombers who police believe wore gloves to conceal the detonators. After a manhunt, authorities arrested the third man in the hat. More recently on a New York City street in September, closed circuit television showed window storefronts shattering and people running for their lives. NYPD investigators were able to rewind the footage from street cameras and spotted Ahmed Khan Rahami in one location where a pressure cooker bomb was found. Law enforcement officials say surveillance video helps create a timeline of suspects' movements before they take action. Terrorists buying supplies in London before committing a series of attacks on the transit system in 2005. And camera footage obtained by the DailyMail.com shows terrorists taking control of a Paris cafe during a series of attacks in 2015. One of those cameras revealing a dramatic moment when a woman's life was spared because a suspect's gun seemingly jams. Bringing Grass, CNN, New York. All right, plenty to talk about now. Back with Paul Cruikshank and joining us, CNN national security analyst Juliet Kayyem. And Juliet, you know, German authorities, they have a picture yeah. of this guy. They have still photos of this guy. What we don't have is, is some of that video that we just saw right there, the likes of which we had previous attacks, this chilling uh, footage of, of these men before they were carrying out the attacks. And it can be instructive. It tells you what they're wearing, where they're headed, what they were doing. And part of that can be crucial to launching an investigation. That's absolutely right. But it's it sort of, it's you can't take Germany out of Germany. I mean, in other words, there's reasons for these rules. And a part of it was because of the surveillance state of East Germany. And so there are actual laws that prohibit real-time CCTV in Germany as a counterterrorism measure, as an anti-crime measure. There's actually a political party in Germany called the Pirate Party that is a data protection party. I mean, it actually exists to prohibit surveillance. And so, um, so there will be changes. There's no question about it because there has been clamoring lately uh, to get more cameras being used by police officers, law enforcement, put them on buildings. I think the amazing thing about what happened this week, though, is there's no iPhone uh, photos either. Remember, Boston was a lot of iPhones. It was uh, private phones. A lot of the cases that you just showed uh, were, were not uh, public surveillance cameras. They were private surveillance cameras. So I still find it remarkable that we have no real-time uh, you know, pr uh, private sector or, or a citizen uh, uh, pictures of what happened and, and of someone getting out of the of the truck. You know, it's not clear that they don't exist, right? The German authorities initially asked people not to release them. They wanted them to go to the investigators so they saw them. So we don't know at this point what investigators have. If they do have them, fair. we haven't seen them, though. And that is interesting, as you say, because, you know, you would think that they would want the public now to be helping uh, with whatever information they have. Paul, 
Do you get the sense that this environment that has existed in Germany is now changing or there will be a greater willingness to change? I mean, we know why they feel the way they do after East Germany and, and the Gestapo and Nazi Germany, why they don't want people snooping all the time. But it does seem like they might be more willing to change that now. Uh, yeah, bottom line, yeah. And in fact, this morning, the German uh, cabinet uh, agreed to a legislative package uh, to um, uh, free up the possibility of having more CCTV uh, cameras around the country, more surveillance cameras around uh, the country. So they are taking what appears to be immediate steps in that direction. Our understanding, John, is that there were a number of CCTV cameras in the area, in the vicinity of, of the attack, and the investigators were able to look through uh, some of that footage. But Juliet is absolutely right that compared to somewhere like London or, 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 or somewhere like Boston, many fewer cameras, mm -hmm. uh, so many uh, fewer images coming in. In the Boston uh, uh, bombing uh, example, there were 10 terabytes of data, video data, that came in uh, within just the first 24 hours. And those were absolutely uh, crucial uh, when it came uh, to uh, identifying uh, the, the suspects in Paul, Boston. Paul, quickly, this is the first I've heard that there have been some security cameras that did uh, at least film the scene with the truck plowing through the market. Do you have any information about whether or not they did see the suspect there or whether it provided any clues? Well, not that they necessarily have footage of the, the truck plowing through, but that they had access to uh, surveillance cameras in the vicinity okay. of, of the attack. That's our understanding. Got to be clear on that. And the fact there are many fewer cameras means they have much less coverage. And not I think that data. they would have had a lot more answers more quickly if they had more CCTV cameras. And, and at the very least, they wouldn't have taken the wrong guy. So remember, we've lost about 24, 24 hours. hours if you had cameras. No one should believe that these cameras will stop terrorism. No one in law enforcement believes, oh, if we just had more cameras, we'd be safer. They are almost in all instances for after the fact identification, um, evidence collection, you know, uh, there'll be litigation, all sorts of things like that, but necessary nonetheless. And finally, I'll just say no one wants to pretend this is an easy discussion to have. Right. We're still having debates in this country over privacy versus security. It is not an easy yeah. answer. It seems easy when you're in the wake of an attack like this, uh, but it is a discussion worth having. Julia Kai and Paul Cruikshank, thanks so much. Coming up, the president-elect meets with his incoming national security advisor and does get the classified presidential daily briefing, which had been a point of controversy to say the least. We're going to take a closer look at how the president-elect is monitoring world events from Mar-a-Lago. That's next.